Okay, so thanks for the organizers for inviting me to discuss this paper. Um, so let me just walk through the paper, the main mechanism, and then make some comments about the assumptions underlying this mechanism. So the motivation really is that mutual funds are invested in illiquid assets. And here illiquid assets are corporate bonds, emerging market assets, bank loans. Now, this specifically excludes equity funds, which make up a large portion of the mutual fund universe. And we're going to see why that's important, because essentially it's going to have a mark-to-market -market rule in that if, if the price of the different assets is observable and it feeds through the NAV, then basically a lot of the run mechanism in this model is not going to, is not going to apply. Now, if you have a mutual fund and illiquid assets, one of the benefits it provides to the mutual fund holder is that it provides daily liquidity. It allows an investor to withdraw in cash at the end of the day at the net asset value, the NAV. Now, if the, cash doesn't, if the fund doesn't have enough cash to uh, meet the redemptions, the fund needs to liquidate non-cash assets to meet those. And there comes the, the main mechanism of the paper, basically originates exactly from this assumption that basically when you need to liquidate assets at below market prices, you're playing around with the NAV. If expectations of liquidations in the future change future NAV, that might make you more or less willing to wait to withdraw to the next period. Okay? Now, the usual story, if you think of mutual fund runs and how they've been covered in the literature, as, uh, in, the, uh, in newspapers and so forth, is basically that consumers sell shares in mutual fund and get the end of day NAV. Now, the fund selling pressure then lowers future prices by a price impact via the, uh, via the redemptions, um, via the need to generate cash for, to satisfy the redemptions, and thus future NAV is lowered. Now, lower future NAV may lead to earlier withdrawals if you as an investor think that you have liquidity needs on the horizon at which this price dislocation is going to apply. Okay? Now, this paper story is slightly different in the sense that the firm here manages liquidity and tries to exploit predictable price fluctuations. That's basically the, the kind of reduced form way of getting the price pressure that we usually have where the price impact into the model without having too much feedback. So the price pressure is independent of the mutual fund trading, but what's now generating the, uh, the intertemporal link is that the fund tries to exploit these predictable price movements. Say you think tomorrow the price is, uh, uh, tomorrow the price is going to be low. So if I want to build cash, I should sell some assets today at a high price so that when liquidity shocks hit my investors and they want to withdraw, I don't have to liquidate at the low price. I have some cash on hand to, to service these redemptions. But this exploiting today means that the NAV today is going to be affected. And therefore, the payoff that investors who may want to withdraw today, their payoff is basically linked to the NAV of today. And so some investors, they might be tempted to take out money even earlier, maybe yesterday, to overcome my, my uh, incentive to kind of screw around with the NAV. Now, the key here is that the lack of the commitment of the fund, it cannot commit not to exploit the mispricing that's going to occur in this model. And this inability to commit is going to lead basically to some incentives to run at an earlier stage. Okay? So let me quickly, let me go through the setup and hopefully identify the two main assumptions that I think are driving the, um, the result. Now, absent trading, the essence on the balance sheets are valued at R. Okay? And so with probability 1 minus pi, the game repeats with probability pi, the game ends at the end of the current stage, and the assets pay R. Now suppose each day, for the, for the sake of argument and for, to make the dis, just, the, just the discussion easier, we're going to split each day into morning, early, and afternoon late. Now of course, usually you get to redeem at the end of day NAV. Here we just pretend that there's two stages, you get to pretend either at the end of morning NAV or at the end of afternoon NAV. Now you're going to have risk-neutral investors that are subject to liquidity shocks. This liquidity shock, it's either an early or late liquidity need, it's going to be realized in the morning. 
So in the morning, you know, are you the patient type or the impatient type, or are you completely unaffected by the creative shock? So there's basically three types. Now, early consumers cannot delay. They immediately want their cash. That immediately results in a certain redemption amount for the fund. Late consumers can consume early, but they might have to take a discount. That is, if they get $100 and theta is uh, 0.9, then they only have a you know, risk-neutral utility of 90 instead of 100. Now, the fund's objective is to minimize losses. So the fund's objective is whenever it does asset sales, it is valued on the books at R, it might have to sell at a price P, and the next slide we're going to talk about the P, and so the fund really just minimizes losses. It does not, and I'm going to get back to that, it does not try to kind of maximize the liquidity provision it does for the investors. Now, the two key assumptions here is assumption one, illiquid assets are not automatically marked to market, but are only selectively so when trading occurs. So essentially, there's a dual role of trade. When you trade, you generate cash, but you're also updating prices. So I have a, my job market paper actually had something like that in a portfolio choice problem. Here it applies in a slightly different setting, in the sense that here, when I trade, I generate cash, but now something is updated on my balance sheet that then affects my net asset value, the NAV. Updating prices, therefore, affects the NAV, and, that, and the NAV is what I owe my investors. If my investor liquidates one share, I owe him the NAV, and so now I play around with their payoff directly. My action of selling something immediately affects their payoff directly. So here, just to... This is, the, this is the main equation for this assumption is basically the NAV today at the end of the period, that's NAV plus, is whatever cash position I have, whatever cash I generate by selling to the position A plus, I guess I, sh I should have, the sign here is wrong, but I generate cash by selling at a price P, and then the important assumption is that the remainder of the assets are still valued at R. So it's not that we update uh, my whole balance sheet, but only selectively on the assets that I sell. Now, you can make a case for that, that if you hold a bunch of different you know, bonds and so forth, maybe if you sell 10% of those bonds, the 90%, you can still argue that they shouldn't be updated on the balance sheet. Now, importantly, this immediately excludes some equity and other assets because they're immediately updated on the balance sheet regardless of your trading behavior. That's the first case. Now, the second assumption is prices, prices rebound predictably within the day, independent of the trading of the mutual fund. It goes from the low price, PE, the early, the, the morning price, to the high price, PL, in the afternoon. And then possibly R ah, is what it's on the book for and what happens if a good shock hits, the game ends, and everything is realized at the, at the price R. Ah. This means that the NAV is a function of sales. But it's not a function of sales because of any price impact, but it's a function of sales because of the accounting assumption we've made. So none of the sales of the, uh, of the mutual fund is going to impact this price path, but how we are going to interact with this price path is going to affect the NAV. <coughs> I'm not sure how realistic this is, especially in the liquid markets. More trading should produce more price impact, but I'm going to get back to that later. Let's first try to get the main mechanism here in a very simple way if I, if I uh, hopefully uh, get this across. So the main mechanism <coughs> is an interaction between, um, I'm just going to get some water here, sorry. The main mechanism is an interaction between the selective mark to market and the price rebound. In a repeated game, the firm may want to build a cash buffer at favorable prices in the afternoon because with some probability the game repeats. It's going to have to carry the cash into the next period. And having more cash in the next period, in the morning, is going to lead it to, have to not have to liquidate as much at the low price as PE. Now, in illiquid assets, the cash buffer trading lowers the NAV beyond what would be required for redemptions. If I today want to build a cash buffer, I'm actually screwing over my investors. Because my investors now have a lower NAV, they have a lower claim on the fund, and so now I'm screwing around with their payoff, 
This lower payout to the investors with liquidity needs in the afternoon, making it cheaper for the firm to meet my redemptions. But the late investors, of course, can think through this. And if they realize that I might, at their expense, build cash, they might want to just go, go in the morning and withdraw their shares and basically then withdraw early. And so if the NIV would be market market regardless of trading equity, there would be no issue. If the price wouldn't exhibit mean reversion, there would be no issue because you wouldn't have any incentive to basically do this trade of let's pay something, let's, let's sell something today in the afternoon because tomorrow morning if the game repeats, uh, we might have to have very bad prices. So a step-by-step -step explanation, consumer no late consumer withdrawing, in morning early consumers withdraw only, in afternoon late consumers withdraw by assumption the firm might sell extra assets beyond the cash needs. Step four lowers the NAV beyond what's required, but then the NAV, but then that might force some late consumers to withdraw early, but then the NAV of step two changes, so we need to find the fixed point here so that our expectations of the cash policy is correct with the, um, with the expectations of the uh, investors. Now, the firm has incentives for step four because of dynamic incentives of carrying cash into the next period. And so that's where the uh, no commitment problem comes in. Because the firm, of course, would like to like, commit to not doing any cash rebuilding. But once the early consumers have been uh, kind of serviced in the second period, the trade off, the value function of having cash in the, in the next, next day is higher than just screwing over a few of my late consumers. Now, the underlying economic force, basically, I just went through this. There's a lack of commitment by a fund. Once morning has passed, I have like three minutes left or something. Okay. And, okay. <laughs> okay. So once morning has passed, instead of to build the cash buffer, I outweigh the NAV loss to afternoon investors. Um, okay. So now, now here come my promise. The required price path seems rather unrealistic. Now, I could buy that there's a price impact today that goes down in the morning and then goes up in the afternoon. But here, the important thing is that it dips again in the morning of the second day, because that's what's really generating your incentive to try to sell or build a cash buffer at this stage, because you know the next morning you're going to get screwed again by the price. So it's hard to imagine that this price path comes from kind of a, a price pressure, selling pressure argument here. Because you have to have other, in the, other actors in the model that kind of sell exactly in, in that oscillating kind of sense. Now, the second one is traditional price impact might actually weaken the run incentives here. More afternoon trading, if I want to rebuild something, lowers the price, so it should lower my incentive to kind of harvest cash from the afternoon, and maybe I do some of it in the morning as well, which then balances the price between the two sub-periods, morning and afternoon, and should kind of weaken the run incentives. Now, the second one is what happens if the price reversion is on a longer horizon than the liquidity, uh, on the a longer horizon than the liquidity shocks, in the sense that here really, or the other way around. Here, the investors need to have a liquidity need. They can't wait, and the prices change accordingly. But what if you're, you, you can wait for a couple of days with your liquidity need? You can easily kind of ride out the, the short-term fluctuations that occur day to day. Now, just let me just pick one more comment because I'm running out of time. There are some possible devices that can weaken the commitment problem. Now, the suspension of convertibility and the redemptions in kind. Let me quickly make a comment about the redemptions in kind. Now, the author claims that they don't solve the intertemporal problem because then the fund doesn't hold any cash and redemptions basically occur in the future, and then basically the fire sales still apply. But that really removes from the investors the ability to sell today, even if they're not shocked, just get all the money in their own hands, and then basically do cash management by themselves. So really, it's basically restricting the investors to live within the period while not having kind of them to do the dynamic management. Now, that's OK, but then the, the, the investors are myopic. And really, what's happening is that we have a dynamic actor kind of doing actions for them.
Now that's fine, but it's kind of a slightly different argument than what the main paper is trying to sell. Now I think I'm out of time. Um, I, I, really, I, like the, I like the mechanism. I don't know if the, if the assumptions are basically, uh, or I need a bit more uh, convincing on the uh, assumptions of this paper. All right, thank you.